Thanks for this opportunity to present this case. Uh, so this patient was a 16-year-old male with heterotaxy, uh, polysplenia, dextrocardia, had a right dominant um, uh, unbalanced AV canal with interrupted IVC and hemiazicus continuation to the LSVC. Um, he initially underwent a PA band and a BT shunt followed by a Kawashima and then had a extra cardiac uh, Fontan with the 18 millimeter Gore-Tex conduit. That was just inclusion of the hepatics. Um, he had uh, normal systolic function with moderate to severe AV valve regurgitation. He otherwise said he was feeling well and uh, we brought him to the cath lab for a uh, Fontan surveillance catheterization with liver biopsy. Uh, so these are the initial, initial angiograms into the Fontan conduit. So this is a, originally an 18 millimeter conduit. Um, he had a two millimeter gradient from the hepatic veins to the uh, branch PAs. And then uh, the conduit narrowed down to about 10 millimeters um, up here, uh, but lower down is about 15 millimeters. So um, given the uh, gradient and the significant narrowing of the conduit, um, we decided to place a stent. Um, while this only has the hepatic flow, uh, we have seen significant rates of fibrosis in these uh, patients, so we decided to, to go ahead with the stent placement. Um, so we decided to, ultimately we were gonna, thought we were gonna need to place two stents, so we started with a 3910 uh, Genesis stent, which was mounted on a 14 millimeter uh, XXL balloon. Uh, so as my uh, partner was inflating the stent, um, we noted that it wasn't, the balloon wasn't coming up um, and we thought it was likely due to a pinhole. Uh, so then we tried to just inflate it by actually pushing the insufflator. And again, we had no uh, inflation of the balloon. So um, as we thought about what we should do now, uh, we thought about pulling the stent and balloon back into the sheath, but uh, the balloon had inflated a little bit and the proximal end edges of the stent were a little bit flared, so that wasn't going to work. Uh, we considered inflating the balloon with a power injector, as someone had talked about yesterday, but in this case, the stent hadn't really gone up at all, so we were concerned about whether that would be, in, how un uncontrolled it would be, and whether we would get the stent in the right position. Uh, we thought about covering the proximal balloon with the sheath to try to inflate the balloon. Um, based on our the, the prior picture, we couldn't really tell where the hole was, so we weren't, again, sure if that would be effective, and if we did that again, it might affect how, how um, controlled, how, in what type of fashion we could place the stent. Um, so then we tried to snare the stent to crimp it down, so we placed a second uh, sheath in the left IJ. Through that, we inserted a snare around the wire and the uh, stent and tried to crimp down the proximal end of, um, edge of the stent, but even with that, we couldn't get it back into the sheath. Um, given that we weren't going through any valves, um, we tried to just pull it back because it was a relatively straight course, but it was getting stuck up in the, in the neck here, so we um, aborted that idea. And then ultimately what we did was um, we actually cut the shaft of the uh, balloon catheter and then we um, exchanged the sheath for a, a larger sheath. So we originally had a nine front sheath in and we put a 14 front sheath. We pushed every we pushed everything back into the into the fontan. We cut the sh just the shaft of the balloon. Like, but so how do you get the sheath through the skin, the bigger sheath? Oh, so we so that's, yeah, I was going to go into that. So we telescoped several sheets. So we had a 14, and in that we had a 12, and in that we had a 10. And so we put all three together over the catheter. We didn't have, we didn't have a dilator in, and with that we were able to get it through the skin. Yes, so we had different different length sheets. We had to use a, a very long sheet for the for the uh, for the yeah. inner yeah. one, yeah. and then we had varying lengths to get get some kind of a transition to get it to the skin. So even with that, you could see here that while the um, stent edge seems smaller than the tip of the sheath, we were having trouble actually aligning it to get it back into the sheath, and so we couldn't pull it in just like this. Uh, this is after we had pulled it, kind of tried to pull it back up. 
Uh, but we had, yeah, we were trying to mainly working up here and then in the uh, neck. Um, so then we ended up placing a second snare through the over the catheter and through the sheath, and with that we were able to crimp down the the proximal um, edge of the stent, and we're able to pull that um, back into the sheet that's up here. So uh, this uh, ended up taking several hours. So ultimately, we decided not to go back and stent this Fontana this time. Um, his liver biopsy did show uh, stage three fibrosis, so it's something we'll have to discuss with the family and are considering bringing him back for, to, to uh, stent it again. Uh, we did try to, just once we were done, I'm not sure why that's not playing very well, but we did try to inflate this with a power injector to see how it was, would respond, and it was pretty kind of uncontrolled, and I don't think that would have worked out well. So I think likely what happened here is we probably over crimped the stent and maybe that caused a hole in the, the balloon and that's why we weren't able to inflate it. Um, you can cut the balloon shaft if you need to exchange the sheath and you can use several sheaths coaxially to allow for a smoother transition. And then in, in this case where the stent's not really up at all, uh, using a power injector can be un uncontrolled and unpredictable. Thanks. <laughs>